Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 335 of our Bible study review. Today, we are continuing in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we are going through the chapters 5 through 8. Now, remember, this is a letter from Paul to the body of Messiah that is in Corinth, and they're not starting off on the good foot. And we're going to pick up in chapter 5. And remember, yesterday when we left off, he said, look, do you want me to come to you with a rod or with hugs? And he's basically saying, it's up to you. I need y'all to clean your act up. But brother Paul has got some more reprimands for the body of Messiah and Corinth. Let's start off in verse one of chapter five. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. I want to stop here and I want to point out something that he says that such immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. Now notice that Paul is not calling the believers in Messiah Gentiles because Gentiles is associated with being a pagan, with being someone who worships other gods. So he's saying you now in Christ, I hear that there's someone among you that is performing something so vile that it's not even done with those who are outside of the covenant. So notice that there are laws for sexual immorality. Now, when he sent a letter out to those who are not natural born Israelites, he told them where to start. Now, do you remember? Because we have reiterated this over and over again. Do not eat food that is offered to idols. Refrain from eating anything that has the blood still in it and refrain from sexual immorality. Now, if you want to go back and see what the laws are for sexual immorality, it's Leviticus chapter 18. And that goes to show you that the laws, the moral laws of Elohim, they're not done away with, okay? I can't harp on that enough, but I'm going to start. I'm going to take you over on a field trip to Leviticus chapter 18, and I'm going to read through verses 1 all the way through verses 8. And so it says, Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. After the practices of the land of Egypt from where you lived, you shall not follow. And after the practices of the land of Canaan, which the land that they were going to inherit, he says, to where I will bring you, you shall not follow, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall follow my decrees and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. For if a man does them, then he shall live by them. I am Yahuwah. Verse 6, he says, None of you shall approach any of his near relatives to have relations, a.k.a. sex. Okay, he's saying, I am Yahuwah. You shall not have relations with your father or have relations with your mother. She is your mother. You shall not have relations with her. You shall not have relations with your father's wife, for this exposes your father's nakedness. And so Paul has heard that there's someone in the camp in the body of Messiah, in Corinth, who was sleeping with his father's wife, which could mean one of two things. This is his mother that he's sleeping with, or this is his stepmother that he's sleeping with. Either way, this is vile. It's gross. All right, back to chapter five in 1 Corinthians, and we're picking up in verse two. It says, but you are arrogant. Instead, you should have mourned so that he who has done this deed might be removed from among you. He's saying, none of you None of you had any sense, had any accountability to point out this sin so that he may be corrected. But no, you let it stay. You let him remain. And so he says, for indeed, though absent in the body, but present in the spirit, I have already, as if I were present, judged him who has done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. So yes, body of Messiah, these are the righteous judgments that we are supposed to make. We are supposed to call out sin when we see it so that that soul may be saved. And those who try to cover up sin for the sake of, I don't know, covering the brethren, you're not covering them in love. True love is calling out sin and protecting them and guarding them so that they don't go to hell so that they don't go to the lake of fire. That's what love is, okay? And so he's saying, this is what you should have done. Paul continues and he says, when you are assembled along with my spirit and understanding that Paul is the spiritual father who set the foundation of the body of Messiah in Corinth, he says, when you're assembled with my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, he says, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh 
He says, hand him over or put him out of the camp, basically. He says, so that the spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So when he comes, he says, look, if you don't put him outside of the camp, if you don't make these righteous judgments and set him outside of the camp so that he thinks about this sin and maybe he repents, he says, if you don't do it, then this person will not be preserved for the coming of our Lord. Verse six, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch? He's talking about one person. If you allow the sin to continue, it will spread like wildfire. And so he says, therefore, purge out among you the old yeast that you may be a new batch since you are unleavened. For even Christ, Messiah is our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old yeast, nor with the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so we see that the Corinthians, right, he's speaking to them in the Passover language. And yes, this is suggesting that he told them to keep the feast, the feast of Passover. That's what the true feast is, y'all. When you partake of the bread and the wine, the true feast is Passover. And so he's telling them, look, we eat it with unleavened bread, which represents his body, which had no sin. He says, do not continue with the leaven. Don't continue with the yeast. Don't continue walking in sin because you are now the body of Messiah. Verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I did not mean the sexual immoral people of this world or the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters since you would then need to go out to the world. He says, but I have written to you not to keep company with any man who is called a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or drunkard or extortioner. Do not even eat with such a person. And a lot of people think that this is contrary to what the Messiah did. Look, the Messiah could not be influenced by sin. That's why he went and he ate with the sinners so that they may be washed by him. But see, we, we can be influenced. And so that's why Paul says, look, don't even eat with a person like this. You can be influenced. Our Messiah could never be influenced by sin. All right. So he continues and he says, for what have I to do with those who are outside? He says, I don't have a right to judge those who are outside. He says, y'all are my flock. Y'all are the ones who I am over spiritually as a father. What business do I have telling someone else who's not in my family what to do? He's saying, do you not judge those who are inside? But Elohim judges those who are outside. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Paul is essentially saying y'all should have some better sense. Y'all really should. Y'all should have known better than to allow this person to remain in the camp so that this desensitizes you and causes the whole camp to fall away in sexual immorality. Chapter 6, he says, Dare any of you having a matter against one another go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? He says, How is it that you go to, you know, pagans, that you go to those who don't care about the laws of Elohim, the Torah of Elohim, and you go to them to decide the holy matters? How is it that you can't handle this within the camp? Verse two, he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge the angels? And that is true. We shall judge the fallen angels. So if you want some scripture to tie back to this, I would suggest that you go and read Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. We need to understand that if we are seated in high places with Christ, we will share in his authority. We will share in judging. Why do you think we are called, you know, a royal priesthood? When he comes and he sets up the millennial reign, what do you think we're going to be doing? We're going to be making sure that those who enter into the millennial reign with fleshly bodies, that they abide by the Torah. So we're going to be making judgments and we're going to be making sure that people fall in line. And he's saying, look, if you can't do it now, what do you think you're going to be doing in the future? I've spoken on this before over and over again. This is the practice round y'all. So if you don't know what righteousness is, if you don't understand what is holy, what is profane, what is holy from what is common, then how would the Messiah trust you to be a part of this great rulership when he comes to rule and reign? If you don't practice righteousness now, 
if you don't practice calling out someone else in the biblical way that is prescribed, if you don't call out sin, if you don't love one of the brethren enough to tell them that they're walking outside of the covenant, they're in danger, then how would you be fit for the kingdom that is coming? All right, let's get back to the text. Paul says, how much more the things that pertain to this life, if then you have judgments dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint as judges those who are least esteemed in the assembly? He says, I speak to your shame. Is it true that there is not even one wise man among you who shall be able to judge between his brothers? But brother goes to the law against brother and before unbelievers at that. I agree with Paul. How is it that we can't settle matters between us, but we go to lawless people and their laws to deal with our matters? We are called to influence the world, not the other way around. Why should we go to the world who doesn't love the Messiah, who doesn't care about his righteous Torah, those who are changing the laws as we speak? They are changing what is right and making what is right wrong and making what is wrong right. How is it that you go to the outsiders to settle your matters? We should know better. And he says, yes, to your shame, because you are supposed to know better as the body of Messiah to uphold his righteous standards. And why would someone on the outside want to come in when they see that we can't even get our stuff together if we're disorderly? Verse 7, Paul continues, Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to the law against one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves do wrong and defraud and do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim? He says, you're going to unrighteous people to handle kingdom matters. He says, they won't inherit the kingdom. So why are you going to the outsiders? He's like, y'all are a disappointment to me, basically. He says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor the idolaters, the adulterers, the male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor those who are covetous. And he says, the drunkards, he says, the revilers, the extortioners, they will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. So why are you going to them to counsel your problems? Paul says, such were some of you. You used to be those people, he says, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, by the spirit of our Elohim. He says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. He says, food is is for the belly and the belly is for food, but Elohim will destroy them both. He says, now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, right? The Lord, the Adon, Yeshua, he says, and the Lord is for the body, right? He is making these examples because we are for him and he is for us. He is the head. We are his literal members, right? You could be the pinky toe, you know, the body of Messiah who is in Africa. They could represent the arm or the neck, but he's saying, look, we are for each other. And he says, Elohim has raised up the Lord so that he will also raise us up by his own power. Do you not know that your bodies are parts of the Messiah? Shall I then take the parts of Christ and make them parts of a harlot? He's saying like a prostitute. He says, Elohim forbid. What? Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot has become one with her body? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Adon, to the Lord, becomes one in spirit with him. So he's saying, do you not get it? Do you not understand. We are called to be one in Christ. We are his body. We are called to consult with him on all matters. Why are we going outside to deal with righteous matters? But he's also addressing the man who actually slept with his father's wife. And so he's talking about these things. Whatever you join yourself to, you become one with. And he says, escape from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man commits is outside of his body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. He says, what? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from Elohim, and that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which belong to Elohim. 
you are not your own. You died with the Messiah and you raised to new life, putting him on and now having his spirit. How then could you go back to the world and connect yourself with the world, right? We see that in the very end, he tells us, come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Come out of this world. Babylon is called the great whore. We need to know that. That's what Babylon is called. And so when you continue to make covenants with her, you become one with her and you defile yourself. You defile the temple of Elohim. Now, as we open up chapter seven, we see that Paul is going to address a letter that he has received from them about marriage. So he's going to address it. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to the wife due affection and likewise the wife to the husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. But he also says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. He says, then come together again so that Satan does not tempt you for the lack of self-control. I speak this as a concession and not a command. So he's talking about conduct with, you know, sexual relations. And he says, look, basically, if you can't control yourself, if you know you've got, you know, a sexual nature and you need to be with someone, he says, get married, get married. And he says, the only reason why you should abstain from sex is that you're both in agreement. You're seeking the face of Yahuwah for a, a particular thing and you're both in agreement about it. But he says, do not deprive one another because your body is not your own. Now, he just told you in chapter six that you were bought with a price. So he's showing you the marriage between people and the marriage that we have with the Messiah, that you are not your own. Once you're in covenant, you are not your own. This is not a selfish thing anymore. Paul says, for I would have it that all men were even as I am, but every man has his proper gift from Elohim, one after this manner and one after that. And Paul is talking about the fact that he's not a married man. Paul himself, he has given his whole life for the kingdom of Elohim. And as we see it, you know, he is going to various places and he is laying the foundation for the body of Messiah, building up the body of Messiah, right? Churches, assemblies. There's only one church, but you know what I'm saying. He has dedicated his whole life to this. And he says, I prefer that everyone is like that. But he's like, not everybody is gifted to live a life of celibacy like me. He goes, some of y'all, y'all need to be married. Verse eight, he says, I say to the unmarried and the widows that it is good for them if they live even as I live. But if they cannot restrain themselves, let them marry. He says, if you got them urges, baby, go ahead. Go ahead and get married so you don't sin. He says, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married, I command, not I, but the Lord, do not let the wife depart from her husband. But if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And do not let the husband divorce his wife. To the rest I speak, not the Lord. If any brother has an unbelieving wife who consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. I know that some of you are dealing with this. Some of you are believers and your spouses are not. So this is for you to listen up to. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy they said, because of you. He says, because of you, the believer, they may be sanctified. Your children are holy. He continues to say, but if the unbeliever departs, let that one depart. A brother or a sister is not bound in such cases. So if you continue to increase in righteousness of Elohim and your spouse departs from you because you love him, because of your dedication to him, he says, let them leave then. If they abandoned you for your love for Christ, he says, let them go. He says, Elohim has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Likewise, he says, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? As I have said before, intercede and pray on behalf of your loved ones. Even if it is your spouse, you have no idea what the power of prayer can do. You have no idea that Elohim himself 
may encounter them in their dreams, right? And, and cause them to wake up and start to seek his face. Do not stop interceding for your loved ones. There is hope, okay? Let's keep reading. Verse 17, it says, But as Elohim has given to every man, and as the Lord has called every man, so let him walk. This I command in all of the assemblies. Is any man called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. So he's talking to Jews, right? Those who are natural born Jews, he says, if you are circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. Now we know the true circumcision, the greater circumcision is of the heart. So he's saying, don't become, you know, uncircumcised. Don't continue walking in sin if you have been called to purity. Oh, better yet, the greater circumcision. He says, is any man called while well uncircumcised? And so he's talking about those who were non-Jews. If you were called while being uncircumcised, he says, let him not be circumcised. He says, you're not going to be saved by being circumcised in the flesh. The greater circumcision is what saves you. All right. We've gone through that in detail before. He says, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Paul says, and we need to pay attention and maybe highlight this. He says, but the keeping of the commandments of Elohim is everything. So he says, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised in your flesh or not. But what is important is that you keep the commandments of Elohim. So let that be known that the Torah is not done away with. We know the greater circumcision is of the heart. And that's where he starts writing his law. And he says, keep and guard those commandments because that's what means something. So he's saying, let yourselves continue in the condition in which you were called. If you are a non-Jew, don't try to convert to be a Jew right? Because the true circumcision is of the heart. And so he goes down and he gives more examples. He says, were you called while you were a servant to someone? He says, well, even when you become free, you become a servant unto Christ. And he says, so we're all in service to one another or in service to Christ, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are called from, continue, right? And so he's going to continue and say, if you are a married man, continue being married. He says, but if you are called while you are unmarried, he says, continue to diligently seek and do the things of the kingdom. Because when you are married, you have to worry about, you know, the things of covering your own household. This is what he starts to say in the rest of chapter seven. So he says, look, if you're married, don't seek to be unmarried. You have been called to marriage for a reason. He says, but if you're unmarried, don't seek to be married unless you've got those urges and you can't control yourself, basically. I'm just paraphrasing the rest of the chapter. That way I'm not reading through the whole thing. I'm going to close chapter 7 with verse 39 through verse 40. It says, The wife is bound by the law, by the Torah, as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wills, but only in the Messiah. So you can't just marry just any old body. He has to be a lover of the Messiah. He says, but in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. He says, look, if you become a widow, he goes, I think it's better that you continue on as a widow because you're not going to be able to serve Christ the same way when you're single as you are when you're married. You have more cares when you carry on a covenant with someone. He says, and I think that I have the spirit of Elohim. Now, we don't know what the letter asked. We don't know, but we just know that he is addressing all of the questions in chapter 7 regarding marriage and regarding, you know, purity, sexual purity. And if you don't have the strength to remain pure, he says, well, get into covenant so that you don't sin. All right. So now let's walk into chapter 8, which is talking about food offered to idols. Now, this is one of those few things that he was giving the instructions for the body of Messiah who were not, you know, Jews. And so this is one of the things that he told them, do not do, refrain from this. And so he says right here, now as concerning food offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge produces arrogance, but love edifies. He says, so if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know, right? A lot of people, when they start learning the truth of Torah, they do. There's this puffed up arrogance and pride that can rise up in your flesh. And he says, you will learn, especially when the Messiah comes, you will learn that you knew nothing. 
if you don't teach and edify in love, then you're just a sounding symbol. It means nothing to Elohim that you know his word, but you don't practice it in love. It means nothing to him. And so he says, but if anyone loves Elohim, this one is known by him. Verse four. So concerning the eating of foods that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no Elohim but one. For there are those who are called gods, whether in heaven or in the earth, as there are many gods and many lords. But for us, there is only one Elohim, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through him, all things and through whom we exist. However, not everyone has this knowledge. He's saying not everyone knows, you know, that there's only one true Elohim. He says, some being accustomed to the idol until now, eat the food as a thing offered to an idol. So their weak conscience is defiled. But food does not commend us to Elohim. Neither if we eat it, we are the better, nor if we do not eat it, are we the worse. And so I have to stop and break this down because a lot of people take this completely out of context, all right? Our God does not change. So the food laws that he made for people in the very beginning, it is the same now. You know, what he said is not food, pork, shellfish, all of those things, they're still not food, okay? What is food is food. So if this is a new believer, this is someone who came out of the nations who used to be a pagan worshiper, and they know that these animals were sacrificed unto these foreign gods. And if they go into the meat market and they know that that has been sacrificed unto another god and they can't deal with it because they feel like that's betrayal to Christ, he says, well, you then being the stronger one should not eat meat if they refrain from eating meat because of this. And Paul is saying, right, that if the meat is clean meat and you're in the meat market and you don't have knowledge of where it comes from, most likely that meat was sacrificed to an idol. Most likely it was, but he says there's only one Elohim. So if it is clean meat, he says, it is okay for you to eat. But Paul is not saying it is okay for you to eat pork. It is not okay for you to eat unclean things. That's not a permission that Paul is speaking. And again, if Paul is speaking a word against the Messiah, then you have to put Paul away because Yeshua is our master. There's no words above his words because he is the word of the father and the father does not change. I will tell you that the same is true today. Many people don't know where their meat comes from. So you don't know if there was some type of ritual or something that took place with that meat. You don't know, right? This is why a lot of people pray over their food, but this is why a lot of people are homesteading and they're growing their own food so that they have total control over what is happening. But I'll give one more example of the type of love that we should cover one another. So say you have a friend and they used to be an alcoholic and you're hosting Passover and you invite them over, right? And you know that that is a temptation unto their flesh. They still struggle with it. Then for your Passover, you should serve only grape juice. Why would you make your brother stumble? Because you have strength in that area, but you know that they don't. This is the type of love that Paul is saying to cover your brethren, that, you know, if they're not strong in their flesh, if they have not overcome something yet, then you shall not have that glass of wine in front of your, you know, brother or sister who is still struggling with that in their body. Whatever it is, and you're aware of it, if you have a brother or a sister who is struggling with something, you should refrain from doing those things in front of them so that they may overcome all right. And so that's how we're going to end chapter eight. Deep and word family. That's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow. Yah bless.